Encircled by two great seas and the Earth's mightiest mountains, India's 400 million people live mainly in tens of thousands of small villages. Such a village is for Sangi in the state of Bombay, just 50 miles from Pune. In Fursangi, the dry season is over. Monsoon rains blowing off the Arabian Sea have refilled the rivers, moistened the earth, and given new life to our land. The day begins when the women of the village come to draw water for their cooking and washing needs during the day. These people belong to a traditional warrior group known as Marathas. And for many ages, the Marathas have always been farmers. Such a one is Rukmini, wife of Vishnu Shevali, a young farmer in the village. In these parts, it is the women's job to haul water. In some villages, men do this. But, as in all India, women learn from early childhood to carry almost anything upon their heads. No one knows how old the village is, but today about 5,000 people live here, gaining a livelihood from their sugar and paddy fields, from the onion and garlic patches surrounding our village. Rukmini's house is made of stone and clay and bears a tiled roof, a sign of moderate prosperity. For in many parts of India, mud and straw thatched huts are quite common. Three children and the youngest is Shiris, eight months old. Cow dung gathered from the fields is kindled between two walls of clay. In India, fuel is scarce, and the dung can't always be given back to the land as fertilizer. The father takes pride in bathing the leaf, his eldest son. Indeed, from rising in the morning, through bathing, eating and household duties, each part of our day proceeds according to established custom. For Vishnu, the husband, washing takes place every morning before breakfast. Tea water is first sweetened with candy sugar. Ranjam loves to decorate herself and imagines she is using kumkum and flowers. And like mothers everywhere, Rukmini gives extra care to her daughter's hair. For daughters everywhere must look beautiful. According to our Hindu custom, father and son generally eat together. Usually, the Hindu wife does not take food with her husband. Instead, she takes pride serving the rest of the family first and eats only after they have finished. 
Dilip, Vishnu's eldest son, is five years old, and already Dilip knows his place and the honor due to him. Vishnu prepares to set out for his six acres of land on the edge of the village. In such a climate as ours, the long linen turban is both light and cool upon the head. With a paste of scented sandalwood, he marks his brow with the religious mark of the Marathas. To orthodox Hindus, each man is a member of some caste, and each caste is part of the whole. A complex scale of orders in which every man has his appointed function, his rights, and his privileges. In Fursangi, the measure of life is the pace of the bullock, for there are very few machines in the village. And so, most of our work is done the time old way, by the hands of men and the help of bullocks. Hindu farmers are deeply devoted to their land, for did not Prajapati, Lord of all creation, entrust it to mankind? And so to us the earth is a mother, to be nourished and in her body seed sown, and water given to cause crops to rise a hundredfold. By mid-morning the small foot tracks linking Fursangi with nearby villages are alive with people. All the villas is busy. Not everyone goes to work. The very old and the very young just sit in the sun, attracted by every sight and scene that passes. Having left baby Shiris in the care of the two older children, Rukmini is off to the Wani shop, the village grocery. Here there is everything an Indian housewife wants. Cans of barley, rice and dal, gram leaves for curries, ginger spices, fennel and sesame seed. Very little meat is eaten in India. Some dried fish, yes. Perhaps an occasional chicken. But meat is scarce and very expensive. As it is, millions in India barely have enough to live on. Water descends from God Varuna, he who has two oceans for his loins and yet is present in every tiny droplet. Water is a purifying substance which must flow constantly. It should not remain motionless about the body. Finally, water is sprinkled around the child's head to protect him from the evil one. Ranjam, 
Bring mummy that powder. Powder, zikda. Ganda shivatli. Number khali. Shiris, sazgala rana diya sir. Must dress Shiris and put kajal in Shiris's eyes. Yes. Must put kajal paste around Shiris's eyes. Shiris la bhi nahi aata. Huh? Shiris, eh, sir, tu is chalta na? Huh? Tu la kaja ga nahi chal. Baba, dar kaja ga chhi ha? Kajal is made from the soot of sesame oil lamp kept burning at the household altar. It is believed to strengthen the child's eyes and keep away all glances the evil one might give him. A dab on the cheek, one on the palm, another on the sole of the foot, and the child is ready for anything. Then with sindoor paste, a tikka mark is made upon his forehead to make him appear even more beautiful. Ah, Shiris, you are such a clever lad, my pet. Such a clever lad. Play, Shiris, play. Shall we go to the fields, my son? Are you coming to the fields to see father? At midday, the sun burns from a glaring sky. Young Dilip, his sister Ranjam, and the mother, clasping young Shiris to her waist, the family meal in the basket, set off for Vishnu's fields. Rukmini has brought vegetables, pancakes made of maize flour, and some curried fish. Vishnu sprinkles the food in blessing. They sit according to rank. They leap next to his father, Ranjam alongside, and Shirish. But where is Shirish? Ah, Shiris rests in the shade of a mango tree. Vishnu's latest joy, a machine worth its weight in gold, to pump up water and so keep his fields moist during the hot dry season. A machine to nourish the tender crops and the great food-bearing palms of coconut, plantain, and date. Vishnu's neighbor grows sugar, and this too needs plenty of water, and another machine to squeeze the juice from the cane. In the afternoon heat, even when there is no plowing to do, the sparrows and parrots must be kept away from the grain crops. Towards evening, the women of the village gather at the watering place to wash down cattle returning from the field. Rukmini comes here every afternoon to wash the family's saris and dhotis. When the last piece of gossip has been exchanged at the pond, the women return to the village 
to prepare for their menfolk coming in from the fields. At the end of the day's work, we sometimes visit the temple. Each village has a temple devoted to one particular god. Ours is the monkey god, Hanuman, patron of strength and loyalty, right arm of Ram, and the supreme being in the legendary history of the Hindu people. In Rukmini's house, there are no windows and kerosene lamps light the way for cooking the evening meal. A special lamp burning nothing but sesame oil is lit before Ganpati, our household god, as a token offering for passing the day in a good way. Wheat flour and water are mixed into an unleavened dough for evening chapatis. Rice is the main staple in other parts of India, but around Fursangi, the rainfall is just enough for wheat and maize, from which we make our chapatis. There will be one chapati for each member of the family, except for baby Shiris who will have his half cup of cow's milk. On special days, there are mounds of saffron rice on buttered plantain leaves and coconut grated fine, cooked in milk and sugar. But tonight, there is just one chapati eat, some brinjal vegetable and fresh beans cooked with many spices. Again, Rukmini prepares to withdraw while the others eat. Vishnu sprinkles water and makes namaskar over the food. Dilip attempts to do the same. So is ending one day in the life of a Hindu family in the village of Fursangi, one small village on our vast subcontinent. But then India lives mostly in our villages. There are over 700,000 of them and these villages are our joy, our strength and our life. The sleep that rests on baby's eyes, where does it come from? Where does it come from? The smile that flickers on baby's lips, where does it come from? Where does it come from? Where does it come from?